Welcome to the 2021 Major Donor Symposium. In this breakout session entitled, A Nimble Strategic Plan, Your Keys to Success, Dr. Scott Rodan, the Chief Strategy Officer at the Focus Group, will guide you through a more strategic and relational approach to raising the funds that are critical to fulfilling your mission. As you listen to the content, feel free to engage with the Q&A feature, where our team members will be standing by to address your questions. Q&A will be available during the session today and for 15 minutes afterwards. For additional resources, including a copy of Scott's slides from this presentation, please return to the breakout session event page after the session to download these very important resources. This breakout session and the others offered today will be available on demand tomorrow. As we get started, let's kick off our time together by letting everyone know where you're joining from and the organization you're connected with by typing that info in the chat feature now. Enjoy this time with Scott. Hello and welcome to this year's symposium and this specific breakout section on this topic of a nimble strategic plan, your key to success. We hope you're enjoying this symposium. I hope that you've enjoyed the speakers, the, the topics. I hope you've enjoyed the fellowship. You know, it's difficult to try to create the kind of community that we love to create at this annual symposium when we're doing it partly virtual and partly here in person. But I think by now we probably have all gotten good at getting the most we possibly can out of community around this idea of being on Zoom and being in person. So we pray that this is a blessing to you. A lot of people spend a lot of time preparing for this symposium so that God might speak to you in some wonderful ways as we gather together right here at the beginning of this fresh new year. So welcome to this year's symposium from the Focus Group. This is my first one. I'm excited to be here. It's been a joy to be your keynote speaker. And, and I'm very excited about this session because this, this is something that I am very passionate about. And I'd love to spend uh, this time with you going into more detail about what we're going to talk about. We're going to spend about 40 minutes here um, in this session, and then we're going to have time afterwards for some questions and answers because I'd love to dialogue with you on some of these important topics. So let's just dive in to this idea of what is a nimble strategic plan and why is that so important right now? Maybe the biggest question is, how do we achieve that in a way maybe that is different than the way we've done planning in the past? So let's jump in. I like, if possible, I'd like to have you think back for a moment to January 2020. Seems like an eternity ago, I know. But think back with me for a minute. When you started last year, when you had a fresh, brand new year ahead of you that said 2020, beginning of a new decade, I know that all of us had plans. We had goals. We had timelines and schedules and expectations. And when we look ahead at 2020 and all that we had on our schedules, all we had on our calendars, all of it was predicated on one significant assumption. That assumption was we are going to be able to physically be together. Think about it. How many events, how many trainings, how many board meetings, how many uh, invitation visits, how many times getting together with our financial supporting partners, schools were meeting together, organizations were having uh, gatherings together, how many conferences. Our entire year was predicated, I believe, on this assumption that we were going to be able to travel to be together, to be in community, and to carry out our mission together. Well, of course, that assumption changed dramatically. And one of my questions that I'm going to have for us here today is how well did we pivot when we saw that this primary assumption about doing business, about carrying out our mission, how well did we pivot? How well were we prepared for it? And what does that mean now at the beginning of 2021, when that problem with meeting is still with us? In fact, this symposium is a perfect example of the fact that we're not out of it, right? We're praying for vaccines. We're seeing vaccines. Uh, but what's going to happen in 2021? It's a very different look today than it was a year ago. But in, I asked the question in January 2020, did, none of us really saw this coming. And I'm not saying that we should have, but here's the question. Should we have seen it coming earlier? 
Did we, did we have our antennae out in such a way that when we began to see the signs of what was likely going to happen or even could happen, were we able as early as possible to pivot in a substantial enough way in order to position our organization, our ministry, our work to still carry out its mission as effectively as possible? Did we see it coming early enough? Were we agile enough to pivot? We've been spending a lot of time in 2020 with organizations. We're doing feasibility studies and capital campaigns. Um, I'm spending a lot of time doing board training. We're doing coaching with executive directors, with board chairs. This has been a year of, of deep dive into the lives of all kinds of organizations across the country. And as I look at how they've answered that question, I kind of have a continuum of responses. And of course, a continuum always takes you a little bit on the extreme of the two sides. But let me share this with you and see if you can identify for yourself where you might fit in this continuum. On the far left, I call the turtles. These were organizations that just withdrew into their shell and said, we're going to hunker down and we're just going to wait till this thing passes over us and then we'll stick our head back out and we'll get back to work. This is the turtle approach to the pandemic. Maybe a little further down, the, uh, down that continuum is what I call the duct tapers. These are the people that organizations have felt, okay, we have to change. We can't do nothing, but we're going to do the absolute minimum required to just hold things together, to duct tape around the holes uh, and, and let this thing survive. We're just going to survive through this thing. And then on the other end, we'll see where we need to go from here. The third people on this continuum are what I would call the temporary pivoters. They took it a little more seriously. They understood that duct tape wasn't going to be enough, as good as duct tape is. They were going to have to make some significant pivots. But the pivots that they made were seen as temporary. What do we need to do for a season now to get us through this? It may be more substantial. We may have to actually change some systems or some ways of doing things. But there was always a sense that this was a temporary measure until we got to some kind of a new normal. The fourth is what I would call shape shifters. They began rethinking the future and began changing accordingly. And they hoped, this is the challenge here, they hoped that when they made some really significant pivots, pivots that they didn't see as temporary, pivots that they really felt were gonna serve them for the long term, they hoped that they got it right. They looked into the new future that hadn't yet happened, tried to figure out what it was going to look like, shifted accordingly, and, and are hanging on, hoping that their understanding of that new normal is right because they've changed everything according to this new vision. They, sh they changed shape, but now everything is banking on the fact that they got it right. Well, the last one, the ones that I want us to aspire to to think about is what I would call the strategically nimble. These are organizations that have adjusted as they have gone. They have read what's going on in the world. They've understood their role in it. They've changed and adapted as things have changed and adapted. When unexpected things happen, like the COVID, vaccine, the, the COVID pandemic took so much longer than people thought. We were into November and December still looking at this problem. We're into January still looking at the impact. They weren't shook by it because they had an ability to change and adapt as things externally and internally continue to develop. They're not counting on the fact that they got it right on what it's going to look like in the second and third quarter of 2021, because if things are different then than even what we expect today, they're still nimble. They're still changing. They're still adjusting. It's that kind of nimbleness that I want to talk about today. Before I jump into exactly what that looks like, though, I want to just take a moment to acquaint us with a, a term here. But Let's talk about nimble. Why did I choose the term nimble? Well, the dictionary defines nimble as quick and light in movement, agile. Some important words in this little definition, quick as opposed to slow, light as opposed to heavy and weighed down, agile as opposed to inflexible. This is a very bad time to have a plan that is slow, weighed down, and inflexible. But we still see it. And when I see plans that are not nimble, they usually fall into some categories. And 
when I see these kind of plans, I, I have a euphemism for them that, that comes out of sort of the, theology, if you will, church theology. I call it strategic plan purgatory. Now, you may be familiar with the idea of purgatory, but the definition of purgatory is a place of limbo where nothing is accomplished and people, and I would say organizations, live in anguish and despair. Now, that's a little heavy, I understand, but maybe you felt a little anguish and despair this last year as you were trying to figure out how to take your organization forward. Let me just share briefly three kinds of plans that I believe end up in strategic plan purgatory. And I'd like to have you be honest with yourself and measure a little bit of your own plan against these three descriptions. The first one I call the painfully prescriptive plan. This is the plan that is too detailed, too far out. This is the plan that's thought three years from now, who needs to be doing what by when. There are, there are measurable action steps and de deadlines um, two and three years out. It's so prescriptive, it's so precise, so far out that people understand so much is changing that it's not going to get done. It's, it's unrealistic. And when people look at a plan like that, especially if you're a year or two into it, and you're seeing that so much of what you thought people should be doing today makes no more sense, well, it just loses momentum. And those are the plans that get put on the shelf. And the shelf is the location of strategic plan purgatory. I say sometimes it ends up propping up a short leg on a desk, but mostly it's on a shelf in purgatory, too, too prescriptive, too far out. A second kind of plan that ends up on the shelf is the overly complex plan. This is the plan that when you when somebody hands it to you, it's, it, it's thick. It may have eight and nine and 10 goals, and each goal has got 15 objectives, and those objectives have got strategies, and, and you're, it's just exhausting to read it, much less think about what it mu must be like to execute the thing. And when people look at this plan, it's just so cumbersome. It's just so much here. They see it as, as overwhelming. And these are the plans that just get dismissed. They just realize we don't have the capacity to execute this kind of a massive complex plan. It also doesn't inspire people. It doesn't unite people. It doesn't get them going in the right direction. And quickly, the third kind of plan is what we call the unresponsive plan. This might be the closest to home for most of us. This is a plan that was put together well. Maybe it's short, brief, maybe it's clear and clean. Maybe when you put the plan out, people got excited about it and it unified people around it, but then things changed. And the plan, the goals and the objectives and the timelines in the plan were no longer achievable. They had to change, they had to shift, but there was no mechanism to do that. There was no ability that we had built in to be able to keep the plan relevant and current. And so all of a sudden we looked at the plan and we said, well, we're not going to do that. Well, that one's never going to happen. Well, that one's way behind. Well, that one's not even making any sense anymore. And the plan just becomes irrelevant. People realize it was great when we put it together. Too much has changed. <clears throat> it's an old plan. It's irrelevant. It gets neglected and it goes on the purgatory shelf of strategic plans. Well, just a quick look at three plans. See if, if any of your plans fit even a little bit into one of these categories, especially thinking about how you started 2020 and what your plan might look like today in January of 2021. Well, if that's the purgatory we want to avoid, then what does a nimble plan look like? Let's take a look at it. I'm going to share with you five keys that I believe are critical. Some of them are gonna be somewhat familiar to you, but I really want you to listen about how they need to be rethought of in light of this kind of a nimble plan. So let's start out. The first is I believe we need to go beyond mission. Mission statements are so important. Mission statements are critical. We spend a lot of time helping organizations hone and define their mission statements so they really use it critically in the life of their organization. But I am convinced that if we're going to have a nimble plan, a mission statement is not enough. I believe it's time for organizations to step back and to ask the why question of their organization. I think we need to reconnect with the core purpose of why our organization was even created in the first place. What were the founders thinking? What need was out there that was so burning that needed to be addressed that this organization was called into existence? What's our why? What's our purpose? 
And then this next step, I really encourage you to take seriously. I've just seen this have such an impact on organizations. And I'll talk about target audiences here in a minute. But even at this point, we know that as we carry out our mission, we have got target audiences that we address in carrying out our mission. It might be our primary recipient of our services, but there's other ones. There's maybe volunteers, there may be a board. It may be our giving partners are part of the target audiences that we, that we address. It might be the larger community, it might be the church, all kinds of different target audiences. In carrying out your mission, you make a promise to each of your target audiences. I love that way of thinking about it. It's as though you looked in the eye of, your, of the people you serve and the volunteers and your giving partners, and you said, we promise to do this. This is what it means to come into a relationship with our organization. If you do as a client, if you do as a volunteer, if you do as a giving partner, we promise this will happen. This is the experience. This is the outcome. This is our promise to you. As you hone those promises, your mission gets so much more clear and specific. And I would really encourage you to take on that little project. It's a fun project, and I think it will help you a lot. Um, the third is to know your values. Uh, most organizations have core values. Some don't. If you don't, you need to have them. If you have them, you need to use them. You need to understand them. How do we define our core values? And what role do they play in how we carry out our work? Are they really the two things I think core values should be? It should be a light post. They should light the way forward. And they should be guardrails. They should keep us from moving away from our core purpose from our core values, and from carrying out our mission. Now, here's the key. When you have know and define these foundational commitments, you can pivot more quickly in how you carry out your mission without risking the core purpose of your organization. There's been organizations in 2020 that made a pretty significant pivot, a pretty significant reframing of who they were, but they did it without losing who they were, the mission, the core value, the core purposes for which they were created. Let me give you an, see an example of see if this will help. Uh, we're in the process of building a new house. Uh, we're going from a big house, we're downsizing significantly, building a much smaller house. Um, and because of the uniqueness of the land, when our architect had the plans all finished and we went out to decide how the house was going to sit on this land, he drove a stake in the corner of the garage. And he said, okay, here's the deal. You can move this house left and right as much as you want, but this is the corner of this garage. This cannot change because of the way the land is and all the rest of it. And so with that stake in the ground, we pivoted literally the house to the left and to the right, looking at how to take advantage of the view and the trees and all the rest of it. And we came up with the final location, but that pivot point never changed. Had we not had that, we could have moved the house in a direction and put it someplace and all of a sudden realized that it was not able to be built. So know this pivot point, this stake in the ground, this important foundational set of documents around which then you can pivot the organization substantially without losing that core purpose, that core value, that mission. Make sense? Second key to a nimble plan is to know yourself. Now, again, all good planning does this, but it is so important at this moment in time. It's an honest appraisal of your current status. Um, it, and we use a SOAR analysis. And again, fairly straightforward, but just think these through with me for a minute. What are the strengths of your organization today as they relate to the accomplishment of your mission? as they relate to you being able to be true to the promises that you make to your target audiences. You see, when we think about strength specifically in line with our ability to carry out our mission and to deliver on those promises, we'll get down to a very specific, clear set of items that we do well. This is what we count on, and it's critical to know that. The second, of course, are opportunities. What are opportunities today in January of 2021 with all that's going on? What are the opportunities unique to this moment that if you took advantage of them, you would better be able to carry out your mission and be true to your promises to your target audiences? Know those opportunities, have them written down, understand what they are. And then, of course, the third is the areas of improvement. What are the key things that keep you 
from carrying out your mission and carrying out that promise. And again, identify the, the most important critical obstacles, those things that need to be improved if you're going to be better at doing what you do. And then, of course, the last one is risks. What are the things out there? And most of them are out there. Some of them are inside. We'll talk about that in a minute. What are the biggest risks right now, the biggest threats that could keep you from continuing to carry out your mission? Do you know them? Are you aware of them? So here's the key. When you have an honest appraisal of your current status, then you can create a plan and pivot on a plan based on reality. When it needs to be adjusted, if it's based on reality, when your plan needs to pivot, when you need to change, when you, you need to adjust, you do it in a way that, that allows you to rely on your strengths and take advantage of those opportunities. And I'll say even one more step here. It might be, and I've seen this in some organizations, that when they pivoted, the pivot was so dramatic that they ended up realizing that if they were going to go this new direction, they were going to have to begin relying on some areas that were their weaknesses. But if you know that going into it, if you've identified those as areas of weakness, you can bring together the resources that you need to shore it up as you move ahead. You see, the biggest challenge we have in making pivots in strategic planning is that we pivot into a situation where we're relying on our weaknesses and we don't know it or we don't know it early enough. Nimble plans understand if we're going to go this way, if we're going to shift our, the way in which we serve our target audiences or what we do this way, we're going to have to shore up some areas or we're walking into an area of risk. We've identified the risks in doing this. We decided not to for a long time. It's, we're going to have to move this direction. So let's take these risks seriously and see how we mitigate them. It's all about knowing so that when you make a pivot, you can be best prepared to move into that new area to which God is calling you. The third key to a nimble plan is to know your context. Now, by context, uh, obviously, that means looking around us, right? And there are two things that we use, two tools I would, I would really have you spend some time using uh, to help you understand context. It's an environmental scan and a trends analysis. It, it helps us um, uh, know what we know well. It helps us to discover the things we think we know, and it helps be very clear on the things we know that we don't know. And that's the real purpose of this. So here's a few of these. External impacts. An, uh, an environmental scan looks externally at those things we think could have the biggest impact on our future. Uh, they're mostly things we can't control. They're things like the economy. They're things like politics. Uh, how much is the changing administration potentially going to impact the way in which you carry out your work? That's an external a scan, that environmental scan. We have to understand and watch that. Legal challenges that might come. Social pressure. How much do we see society changing in such a way that there may be increasing social pressure, either positively or negatively, for what we do? Do we understand the environment externally in which we need, need to operate now and where we're going? Another is the needs of our target audience. And I believe this is something, my friends, that most faith-based nonprofits, probably all nonprofits, don't spend enough time thinking about. The people we serve, their demographic, their views, um, a whole slew of characteristics about them is a changing target. And they're not the same now than they were five years ago. They're not going to be the same in the next couple of years. Do we understand the needs of our target audience? And are we able to see changes in those needs early enough so that we can continue to shift and address to be able to meet those needs? Do we know the needs of our target audience, what they value, what they believe they need, and how well we're meeting that need? It kind of goes back to our promise. And then we look at trends. We look at the external environment. We look at trends. Where do we see things going? Uh, who are the people out there prognosticating and looking ahead a little bit? As hard as that is today, there's still good trends analysis going on out there. What does it mean in terms of our industry? You all work within an industry, within the Christian nonprofit world. What are the leaders of your industry saying is the future of your kind of nonprofit? Um, what are the demographics, the sociometrics that are happening? What the, the economic realities for our industry, for our world? Um, what's going to happen with the church? We're looking at millennials and Gen Zers and all the rest of it. it, it you don't want to get overwhelmed with this, but we can't afford to ignore it. We need to do an environmental scan and, an, and a trends analysis and bring those two things to bear on the planning that we do. When you know your environment and understand these trends, you can adjust in a way that keeps you ahead of the, their impacts 
on effectiveness in your organization. And that's really what this is about. It's about knowing the things that could have significant impact on you from your environment, from the trends of where things are going, and see them coming far enough ahead that you can use your nimble plan to make changes and adjustments before they hit you. It's proactive and not reactive. It's, it's preparing rather than responding. That's what this important one is about. So number three, know your context. Number four is naming your assumptions. All strategic plans are built on assumptions. In fact, when we do strategic planning through our discern process, that's a big part of what we do. We help organizations define their assumptions. Um, we define what will happen and we define what will not happen. We assume that, and let me just put it this way, a good strategic plan uh, creates a, a picture of your desired future. When I look at a good strategic plan, I want to be able to have you tell me three years, let's say it's a three-year plan. Three years from now, walk me around your organization. Put your arm around me and walk me around and say, Scott, this is what we're going to look like. This is what we're going to be doing. These are the people we're going to be serving. This is what our staff's going to look like. This is what our board's going to look like. This is what the world's going to look like as a result of us having achieved these things. This is the, this is the strategic vision, the narrative of who we're going to be in three years. That's what excites people. That's what has financial partners give and people want to come and work for you and, and all the rest. That's what unites people is that vision, that narrative of where we want to go. Well, as I look at that narrative for an organization, you can step back and say, okay, in order to get from here to there, you're assuming a number of things are going to happen, your goals and objectives, right? You're also assuming a number of things are not going to happen. Part of that is that environmental scan and trends analysis. We're going to believe that things about the economy, things about politics, things about legal, things about social, things about our community, things about our ability to hire the key people that we need. All kinds of things come into play about what will or will not happen. And those are your assumptions. And the key here is to know them and to name them. A, a strategic plan really is, is loses its value if you have not in the process named those assumptions. Now, some you're going to find you can control, and those are hopefully the goals and objectives that are going to get you there, and some you can't, and that's okay. But you've named them. You know what they are. Examples, we've talked about a few of these. Now, the economy's impact on giving is certainly an, um, an example of an assumption. You're assuming you're going to be able to raise a certain amount of money in a certain way at a certain time to be able to fund what you do. Uh, legislation that either helps or hurts your mission, you're assuming um, certain things about what might or might not happen. Your ability to hire and retain key staff. Many times strategic plans say, you know, next year we're going to hire a director of, of development or we're going to expand here. Or we're going to bring in a key person there. Well, the assumption is that you're going to find the person and that they're going to be good and that they're going to be effective. You have to name that and know that uh, because if they're not, that's going to impact your plan. Ability to know and meet the needs of our target audiences. We've talked about that. Stability and leadership. You're probably making some assumptions about your board and your CEO and your leadership team and whether they're going to be around through the duration of this plan. It's just naming them so that everybody is understanding these are our assumptions of what will and will not happen. You see, when you know your assumptions, you'll also know when they change. And as they change, you can adjust your plan before the full impact of that change is felt. I'm not sure there's a more important key to a nimble strategic plan than this idea of being able to watch assumptions, know when they change, and be able to make sure your plan, and we'll talk about this in a minute, is able to change with it. Then you've got a nimble plan. The fifth one is using scenario planning. Now, scenario planning has been around a long time. And frankly, for the last 15, 20 years that I've been doing strategic planning, I've had a hard time, if you will, selling strategic uh, scenario planning. People say, yeah, I know it's a good thing to do, but it takes a couple extra sessions. It takes some time. It takes a little bit of money. And really what we're doing is we're making plans to respond to things we don't think are going to happen. And that's hard to sell people on. We're going to spend time doing what? We're going to put together a plan so that we're able to respond to something we really don't think is ever going to happen. Well, in 2021, it's a little easier to sell scenario planning because we just came through a year where major things happened that we didn't expect. So I would really encourage you to in include a scenario planning process 
in your strategic planning work. I think it's a key to nimbleness. And real quickly, I'm not going to spend much time here. I'm just going to run through these quickly. But these are this is how you do a good scenario planning process. You define the driving forces, the assumptions. We already talked about this. This is just another word for assumptions. You've already done that. You've named your assumptions. You understand what they are, but what will happen and what will not happen. You've created your official future. It's that narrative I was talking about, that picture of where we're going to be in three years. So we know our assumptions. We've got a clear idea of what that's going to look like in three years if we're able to carry out our strategic plan. That's our official future. But now we step back and we say, okay, what if... What if some of the key assumptions that we have in place end up being significantly different? And this is where you can, you can do a positive and a negative. You can go on the positive and say, well, what if some of the assumptions are better than what we thought? What if things actually do better than what we thought? What if we're able to raise more money? What if we're able to bring on some other key people? What if um, our program effectiveness is much more than what we thought? What if partnerships open up more possibilities than what we expected? And as you build a scenario, you can say, oh, if these assumptions actually are better than what we thought, well, wow, there's our, there's our key and our, our official future changes. It looks a whole lot better, even than the good one that we put together. And you're able to, to see a course that can get you to even a better official future than the one that you plan for. And on the other side, you do the same on the negative side. What if some of our key assumptions don't turn out? What if some important things we're planning on end up taking longer or get delayed or just don't happen at all? And it's not quite a survival uh, scenario. It's, it's more positive than that, but it does take into consideration how will you respond? How will you sustain yourself? And how will you still carry out your mission in an effective way if some of your important assumptions don't turn out? And you know, there's a, there's a sense of freedom and confidence that comes when you're able to stare that negative scenario in the face. Look at the three-year um, picture of what you would look like in three years and say, okay, that's okay. We're still doing our work. We're still being effective. We, we, can, we can survive and thrive even in a worst-case scenario. When you've done that, then you've got an idea of, of where you might go. And here's the most important thing. The whole purpose of scenario planning, yeah, I believe, is not just having those three plans, but it's identifying as early as possible which of those three scenarios is reality? And it's watching those assumptions. The earlier you can come to your leadership team, or your board and say, you know, folks, this is the desired future direction we're going. It's looking pretty much now like we may actually be on the better side of what we thought. And I think we need to adjust our plan to get ready to even do more things than we expected. Or of course on the negative side as well. So when you create scenarios, you have options already vetted and decided in a less stressful time. And in the end, that's really it, isn't it? If you had a scenario planning in January of last year that, that none of them could have looked forward to, to COVID. I'm not saying that it's any good scenario planning in 2020 probably built in a an international pandemic of the kind that we've seen. <clears throat> but if you, if you build these in um, and you see these things happening and you're able to make those kind of changes early on, you, you're going down a path that you considered when the pressure wasn't on, when you had a chance to just sit and it was sort of, sort of theoretical, it's kind of hypothetical. And at least in a quiet, calmer setting, you've court, you set out a course that now you can take uh, when the pressure is really on either positively or negatively. So using scenario planning is an important part of a nimble strategic plan. Well, those are my five. And I'm going to end now with one thing that is more important than all five of them. Uh, it is the most important thing that we do if we're going to have not only a nimble plan, but the other word I would use is now a faithful plan. And that is prayer and discernment. My friends, no one is more nimble than the Holy Spirit. If we are listening to God's leading, we will always be relevant and agile. I believe that with my whole heart. If your strategic planning is bathed in prayer, if you're inviting God in at every significant, important moment when decisions are being made, if you're inviting other people to pray and giving input and you're listening to what they're saying, what's God saying to you in this process? Where do you believe we're in line with God's will? In essence, all a strategic plan is, is understanding what God wants to do with the future of your organization and getting in line with it and putting a plan together and, and, and making it happen. This is God's work done God's way. 
for God's glory. If that's our strategic planning process, I believe we'll have a, a, a nimble strategic plan. What could be more nimble than walking with God and his vision for the future of your organization? Discernment is the non-negotiable element in a nimble strategic plan. So let me ask you, how are you building serious, prayerful discernment, both into your planning and into the execution of your plan? Pray as you begin. Pray as you proceed. Pray whenever you get stuck. Pray when you fail and pray when you succeed. When we allow God to lead us, we can trust his timing and his power and his provision for whatever it is that he calls us to do. If this is really God's plan, if we really believe that we're aligned with God's will, then can't we trust completely that he'll provide all that we need, the strength, the power, the provision, opening doors, everything that we need in order to continue to walk according to his will and his way. Align your plan with God's heart and you will have a nimble and effective strategic plan. Well, let me wrap it up and put all this together. Avoid strategic planning purgatory. Avoid those things that will make this plan irrelevant, dismissed, too overwhelming, put up on the shelf. Be able to pivot around the anchor points of core purpose and promise. Put that stake in the ground and make sure everybody knows them and, and those don't change. Make adjustments when you do that. Build on strengths and take advantage of opportunities. And if you have to go in that direction, make sure to, you can mitigate risks as you move in a new direction. Understand and adapt to your changing external environment. Understand the trends so that you're able to see things coming as far ahead as possible. Know the assumptions upon which your plan is built and be ready to adapt as they change. Let me just say a word here. They will change. They will change. Uh, Dwight Eisenhower, the great general, made the comment, I have found plans to be useless, but planning indispensable. Planning indispensable. It's the process of thinking and adjusting as you go. Every good football coach knows that the game plan is perfect until kickoff. Um, as soon as we get into life, our assumptions are going to change. Can your plan? Can your plan? Be prepared to adjust to different scenarios because you've already considered them. Nothing really takes you too much by surprise. You've sort of thought this through and now you can move in that direction. Oh, my friends, and ensure that your plan is born in prayer, guided by intentional discernment. This has got to be intentional. This has got to be the highest commitment that you have in your planning process for intentional prayer and discernment. It's adjusted by the Holy, by Holy Spirit-led leaders. That's really what we need to be, isn't it? We need to be leaders who are listening and aligned with what God is saying. We need to be led by the Holy Spirit to make these adjustments. We need God's wisdom in, in all of this. And then celebrate it in ways that give God the glory. The great thing about a nimble strategic plan built on God's desire for your future is that when good things happen, he gets the glory. And that's really the purpose. Isn't that our greater mission? Our greater mission is that God is calling us to do his work He's calling us to do it his way, aligned with his value, according to his leading. And he does it for his glory, for the building of the kingdom. And if that ends up being our North Star, my friends, we can build nimble strategic plans that will truly serve the kingdom of God in whatever happens in the world around us. I commend that to you as a way of thinking about going into 2021. May you be blessed in that process. Let's uh, take some times now for questions and answers and talk a little bit more about how we do this.